I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and today we're going to talk about the 2023 American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines for the management of atrial fibrillation. AFib is common. It is often first identified in our offices in primary care, and it substantially increases the risk of stroke, dementia, MI, and heart failure. Once AFib is detected, there are three areas of care that need to be addressed. First is symptoms. Often that's rate control, sometimes rhythm control, then stroke risk, and addressing modifiable lifestyle factors. Once AFib is diagnosed, a patient needs an echocardiogram and they need blood work, which should include a CBC, a CMP, and a TSH. Stress testing is not routinely needed. When someone presents with AFib to the office or to the emergency room, usually the first decision is around rate control. Decisions around rate control uh, are made by symptoms aiming for a heart rate less than 100 to 110 beats per minute. For acute rate control in the setting of rapid ventricular response, or RVR, as well as long-term rate control, either a beta blocker or a non-dihydroperidine calcium channel blocker that is verapamil or diltiazem is what is recommended. Whether someone needs to be sent to the ER is a matter of clinical judgment. If someone has HEFREF, then calcium channel blockers should not be used. A third line agent is digoxin. If digoxin is used for long-term management, then serum levels should periodically be checked and the goal serum level should be less than 1.2. Notice that is different than the old goal of less than 2.0. In the ER, if further rate control is needed, IV mag can be used. If someone has decompensated heart failure and beta blockers or calcium channel blockers are not effective, then amiodarone can be considered. Next decision is around anticoagulation for stroke prevention. Calculate the patient's risk of stroke using a validated stroke risk score, such as the CHADS VASC score then take into account the risk of bleeding. Decisions around stroke prevention balance the risk of ischemic stroke with the risks of bleeding. If a patient has an estimated annual stroke risk of greater than or equal to 2%, that's a CHADS VASC score of greater than or equal to 2 in men and greater than or equal to 3 in women, then the guidelines recommend anticoagulation which reduced the risk of stroke in both paroxysmal as well as persistent AFib. For a 1 to 2% risk, now that's a CHADS VASC score of 1 in men and 2 in women, anticoagulation is considered reasonable. For patients in that intermediate zone, there's a lot of clinical judgment involved, and there's also, of course, important judgment involved for patients who have an increased risk of bleeding. DOACs are recommended over warfarin unless someone has moderate or severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical valve in place. In people who can't take oral anticoagulation, surgical and percutaneous techniques now to occlude left atrial appendage are an option to reduce the risk of ischemic stroke without using anticoagulation. Also, it's important to realize that for patients with AFib and chronic coronary disease beyond one year after vascularization, without a history of stent thrombosis, antiplatelet therapy should not be used in addition to anticoagulation as it increases the risk of bleeding and doesn't decrease important outcomes. People who have device-detected AFib, that is, detected in someone who's not having symptoms with a watch detecting it or some other device, have a stroke risk that's lower than people who have symptomatic AFib. And the recommendations for device-detected AFib vary by their duration of AFib as well as by the individual's chad VASC score. See the guidelines if you're interested in more on this fascinating topic. Finally... Let's talk about restoration of sinus rhythm versus rate control alone. The guidelines state that this is a nuanced decision. The benefits of rhythm control include improved ventricular function, decrease in symptoms, improved quality of life. 
One large study, the East AFNET study, showed that an early rhythm control strategy was associated with a 25% reduction in the combined endpoint of mortality rate, stroke, and hospitalizations due to heart failure or acute coronary syndrome. Characteristics that favor rhythm control include a younger age, a shorter duration of AFib, a higher symptom burden, a smaller left atrium, and greater left ventricular dysfunction. The specific treatment for rhythm control, which can be pharmacologic or be done by catheter ablation, is discussed in detail in the guideline. I think this is a decision that is not one that we are going to be making, but one that our cardiology colleagues will make. Recent trials have shown a significant reduction in recurrent AFib with catheter ablation compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. Finally, believe it or not, lifestyle factors influence the degree of AFib symptoms, the recurrence of atrial fibrillation, and even progression from paroxysmal to persistent AFib. The most impactful of the lifestyle factors may be obesity, with a 10% decrease in weight leading to improvement. Also recommended is at least 210 minutes per week of exercise, smoking cessation, screening for obstructive sleep apnea, and minimizing or eliminating alcohol use. Fortunately, caffeine doesn't generally have an effect, though it's reasonable if the patient notices that caffeine is a trigger then to avoid caffeine. This is a lot of information for something that we take care of frequently. I'm interested in your thoughts. Please leave them in the comments section below. This is a critically important update. I'm Neil Skolnick, and this is Medscape.